door to Tidemore Gardens and Reginald House in Deptford, South East London, for nearly a decade. Deptford has been touted as up and coming for years, and it is changing. Blocks and blocks of private flats have been springing up, made way for by bulldozing cheap art studios. Rents have doubled since I moved here. There are fewer fruit and veg sellers and music venues, more boutique shops and hairdressers I can't afford. The air pollution levels are amongst the worst in London, and there's not much green space for the number of people who live here. A lot of the Deptford I love is still here though. It's the empty buildings turned into community centres, the parks I've helped organise festivals in, the estate allotment where I learnt to grow veg. I've got to know people with very different backgrounds to me, and I can't walk down the high street now without bumping into someone. I feel part of this Deptford because I've helped change it, and it's also changed me. Tidemore Garden and Reginald House belong to this Deptford, for myself and many people I know. That's why we fought so hard to keep them, and why I think what happened here should never have been allowed to. Okay, how we start? Okay, we well, can just start here. <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, so, so really. I guess we'll just walked in this is what kind of hits you when you first enter the garden mm-hmm. what does it mean to you when you first come into the garden um i think i just take a huge deep breath it's the yeah. first thing i do when i come in here i feel calm and excited as well about who might be here and what might be happening yeah yeah oh the first time i went to the garden uh just walking past on a hood some ladies singing out inside, you know, like they were practicing like. And I just stood there. You could almost say mesmerized, like, you know, like this is on my doorstep. As soon as you walked in there, you just felt relaxed, calm. You just want to put your feet up. It was like a place where you could just forget about everything. And I believe here there are pumpkins and Courgettes, I think maybe. They look like courgette flowers. Yes, yeah. We yeah, haven't grown really so much this year, but um, We've but it's a bit nice. Distracted, aren't we? Yeah, just slightly. <laughs> <laughs> I first went to the garden um, when we were asked to come as Nature's Gym, which is a a council-led group of volunteers that work in the green spaces of Lewisham in all the nature reserves. So when I was thinking of moving to Deptford, I was very pleased to find somewhere just about next door to the garden because I already knew it. So from when I first moved here, I started going to the garden for a lunchtime club and a clear out and gardening, food growing, 
it was a big part of my life in settling into Deptford and meeting new people. And it was the sort of thing that I wanted to do in my retirement. Mm. So it was hugely meaningful for me. So this was, the garden was the school playing field? Originally, yes, and then it became the school garden. And this was the school playground. And luckily, when the council allowed us to um, use the garden again, they also allowed us to use this playground. And so the boundary goes up as far as the wall around the school buildings, the old yeah. school buildings. And this playground has been really useful um, for certain events um, to hold the polytunnel, yeah, yeah. where we've been growing tomatoes this year. Also, this was full of rubble. We called it the pub for the uh, Jamaican Independence Day right. celebration. That's got a temporary roof on it now and is a usable dry space. Originally, it was the, the school got some funding from uh, groundwork and the council. The council put in £100,000 at the time. The school teachers, the kids, local people from the community all helped create that garden. It was opened by the mayor in the late 1990s. It was just an amazing, tranquil space. You wouldn't think it in um, a busy sort of urban street, you know, sort of quite a gritty area that's got lots of interesting culture. It's this incredible secret garden, the incredible Indian bean tree that had been planted in memory of the school teacher who died there the ponds and the newts and everything. It was just a really interesting nature space, really hard to find. We're about to approach what many consider to be the piece de résistance of this garden, which is, um, which are the two amazing Indian bean trees that we have. And in between them, the beautiful tree house that children just make a beeline for as well when they come in well and adults actually freshly painted freshly painted yes yeah I didn't really know about it until I was approached by two of the guardians in the school that had opened up the garden after the school had moved and they approached an organization that I was heavily involved with which was um, a volunteer-led community arts organisation and they wanted us to help them deliver a community event. And Madcap used to, we made our own games like fairground games, the idea being that um, people were spending too much time on screens and we wanted there to be human interaction so all the games we made were really stupid but they um, enabled people to engage and we'd programme different cultural events or dance or music. I just saw it had an enormous potential to be an inclusive space that was actually quite healthy as well and um, I just thought this is a beautiful place to hold family and community events. A couple of times we had the children from New Tide Mill School in. I, I helped out when the children came to plant bulbs there so we planted all these daffodil bulbs. I think some of the children hadn't done anything like that before. I'm not sure they'd even touched the earth before. Certainly their new school hasn't got any earth, it hasn't got any grass and there's nowhere to plant a bulb. It's somewhere that I took my granddaughter every time she was here and she loved going on the swing and and trying to catch a newt in a net. They're just things that urban children don't have a chance to do. Climb a tree, go up the tree house, see things growing that they've planted. It was common, it was, it was, it was, it was amazing to see everyone wanting the same thing. I should say from the, from the garden, I think it's from each other as well. You know, you know, everybody just wanted to have a good conversation, like 
to stop, to breathe, to say hello, to take time out, to say, you know, who are you? I am. Hello. Nice to meet you. The amount of people I've met through the garden, that alone is valuable to me. You know, that is community spirit. You know, that brought the community together. And I, now I can walk in depth and then nod my head and say hi. You feel part of the community. Like, you know, you might not remember all the names, you know, and you hi, morning, or oh, how you doing? You know, and just walk along the street and just, you know, have that tunnel vision as most people have when you're walking along the street. So I don't know. It's just, it's, a, it's such a tragedy to lose this space. It really is. I mean, I, yeah, we've all, every, anyone that comes in falls in love with it. And they're taken aback. Oh, I didn't expect it to be so beautiful. Or I, oh, I didn't expect it to be so big, you know. I thought there's always a surprise when people walk in here for the first time at its beauty and its vibe. Yeah. I couldn't even tell you how I ended up in Deptford, but from the moment I did, I loved it. I started off at a lanyard house on Pete's estate, and I pregnant with my daughter and was offered this place, and I've been here subsequently now 33 years. Coming from Pete's estate, you know, massive estate, with all flats cramped, cramped all up together, and then being offered like a maisonette, you know, two bedroom maisonette, it was just wonderful. The only Downside was um, they let you view these places in the summer, so you didn't realise that the only heating was an electric heater for the whole house. <laughs> Sorry, a gas heater it was in those days. So when winter came, it was like, oh gosh, yeah, I didn't think that one through. But <laughs> apart from that, yeah, it's brilliant. And then I raised my kids, now my grandkids. Three generations <laughs> this house has gone through. Most of my neighbours, have been here 20 odd years, nearly 30 years themselves. Mm. Nobody wants for anything, everybody's friendly. Um, even when newcomers come, they automatically feel that friendliness that we already have, and we've already established, and they know that everyone's safe, everyone's okay, you know, if you need anything, you can knock. We had to take care of each other's kids back in the day when um, we were all on benefits and suffering. If, one person cooked, they'd feed everyone. Yeah. You know, everyone would help each other out in one way or another. We lived like a massive family. It was... I'd say going on 12 years now that we first got advised that they were going to knock down the building. We were all appalled, we all clubbed together, we done many petitions, not just within the block, surrounding streets, um, produced them to the council many times, over and over and over again to the point where it was never, ever, to this day, been acknowledged. When I first stumbled upon the garden, you know, I met some wonderful people. Initially, one of my neighbours um, met up with the group before myself, and I was very disappointed. And I was going, no, 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 nothing's going to happen. You know, they're just going to ignore us as usual. But meeting the campaigners for the first time, they gave me hope, they made me think that, you know, it is worth fighting, it is, you have still got a voice. Well, the plans were quite vague from the council at the time and 
With Andy Belfield's help, he produced an alternative plan as part of his final year architecture course. With the school buildings, there were uh, sort of playground areas that could be sacrificed so that you could keep a garden, and a disused car park. And he effectively showed through his plan, um, you know, that you could get in the 208 houses or homes without destroying the garden and without destroying Reginald House. That initial plan only had something like, I think it was 12% social housing in it, that it was skewed very much to private housing because, remember, this is all about the council selling off their land to developers. That was one of our arguments, that it should have been at least 50% social housing. That um, next planning meeting, decision-making... There were enough councillors who didn't want it to be just nodded through. At that point, we, we thought that reason would prevail and that they would do something different. And we asked for separate meetings with the architects and then the uh, developers and the council uh, to see if we could then push back and use that space before it came back to planning to get a community collaborative plan in place. That's what we wanted. They still went ahead with the second application to for planning without changing anything, apart from the fact that they'd managed to get a grant from the GLA and that the council had agreed to put 4.3 million into the scheme themselves. Nothing had changed apart from the increase in social housing that was part of our objection, but it was only a part of the objection. It wasn't, you know, the sum of it. just want to welcome you to the Old Tide Mill Wildlife Garden. This event is brought to you by the Tide Mill Campaign, which is a unified campaign between the people that use and love the garden and the Reginald Road flats next door, the 16 council homes. Um, Both are due for demolition, um, and so we have been campaigning. Um, If if you want to talk about here, if you want to talk about Tidemill Gardens, I supported the proposed development at Tidemill Gardens, and I'll I'll tell you why. Um, I think this this is a fantastic space. Um, but the overwhelming problem facing our community is housing. Um, I met a woman on, I'm not going to say which estate, um, but a woman uh, on an estate in, in this ward who is living in a bedsit which is no, no bigger than this tent. It's not six metres by six metres squared. She is living in misery. This development here will deliver an additional net 106 social homes for the 2,000, I would appreciate if you didn't shout over me, Sue, for the 2,000 homeless households in Lewisham. I have to represent uh, both the people who use this this, this park and also Hayley, who is desperate for a home. And that is why I support this development and I will defend it to anyone. I feel deeply that like, sense of um, empathy that Joe feels when he... Um, tells us about what he expected, what he um, experienced with Haley, and I know personally of um, a woman that is living with two teenage chil- children in one single room, and one of the ch- children is a boy. Um, but I just think that when it comes to um, what's going to happen here at Tide Mill, that Labour seem to have done something wrong because Hayley can't find somewhere to live. And I'm wondering if Joe or anybody else could explain to me why Hayley can't find somewhere to live when um, at least 25 developments have been built in this area in the last 15, maybe 20 years or so. Thank you for that question. Big developments. I don't think anyone in here is against the building of social housing. I think everyone in here is for social housing. But the, quest- but the question is, why do we need to destroy social housing in order to build it? Across London, the whole estate regeneration programme, 237 council estates are uh, under threat of demolition. And another 420 luxury towers in the pipeline. 
How, I mean, it just doesn't add up. And why, Joe Dromey, are you so focused on talking about the figures for this particular development? Even though we're here to talk about Tidemill, but I think it's about much more than that. What about the whole borough? Where's the social housing in all the other blocks that have been built? What did you say? Kent Wharf, nothing? Sun Wharf, 11% or the other way around? Okay, why so not on these developments? Why here? Why demolishing a green space when you could have all these units in all these other blocks that have been built in the last decade? Okay. Um, why am I focused on the figures and why do I support the development? Because it's going to be an additional 106 uh, homes and those will change people's lives. They will change the life of people like Haley, whose life is being blighted. I, look, you can, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When, when I'm, so, I'm gonna finish. When you have a woman cry on you because of her housing situation, I, okay, I was, I was brought to tears by what I saw in this, look at you rolling your eyes. I was brought to tears by what was happening, by, by this woman's situation. I am fighting to try and get her a home. That is why I want to build homes here. I will not apologize for it. I will take you shouting at me all you want, but I'm gonna stand up for social housing. You can take your sense of moral superiority. That's fine, but I'm gonna be held accountable on May the 3rd and we're gonna build social homes. You know, the stab in the heart is the latest drawings where they're going to totally knock down this block and then rebuild exactly on top of it, you know. Why don't they just maintain this block? In the beginning, we'd call up, you know, it was like any other council, we'd call up for repairs and they'd come straight away. Everything was done immediately. The block was cleaned regularly, maintained regularly. Um, but since they've decided they're knocking down the block, everything stopped. Because I mean, they'd say that they promised you, you know, you can have these new flats, you'll get the same number of bedrooms, you'll get the same rent, and they, you know, just making out like, I don't know, you're making a fuss, or just trying to block their plans. Because we haven't had anything in writing. The letter that they keep, the decant letter that they keep sending us, they didn't even have the decency to change the date on it. It's the same one they've been sending for years and years and years. And the solid building, there's nothing wrong with the building. There's no reason, no valid reason for them to be knocking this block down. They were dancing around our um, concerns. That's the word I'm trying to think of. Dancing around our concerns. And they were not answering any questions as such. Yeah, and since then, I thought, no, this is trouble. This is this this can't be happening. Someone got the, someone got shame on Peabody. Yeah. Should I get that out? Oh, yeah. That's great, Ian. That's really nice. Yeah. Involved with it, and we don't think that Mr. Sarsfield will be aware. Um, so we have written the letter, right. and we'd love to be able to give it to him by hand, please. By hand, um, I'm please not sure. Come in peace. We're not. We're not going to cause any trouble. Yeah, I understand. Um, I'm not sure if he's in the office today, or if you'll handle that to me, I'll make sure he gets to the right person. Could you find out first of all whether he's here, please? Um, because we really would like to talk to him if we can. Yeah. Yeah. That's or fine. some, Thank or you. someone else senior yeah. in Peabody. Yeah. Thank Thank you very much. Much. All right. Thank you. Hello, I'm David Lamarack. 
I'm one of the executive directors here. Oh, thank you. Thank I'm you very for pleased coming to come and meet you. Thank you. I'm Andre de Bruno. Right. I'm one of the campaigners. Sorry, it's a tribal dog, okay? Yes? Yeah, it's a, it's a place in Deptford and it's yeah. a, a, a wildlife space that mitigates the pollution by half of the local roads. Right. And yeah. Also, there's 16 council flats due for demolition. Right from the beginning of this campaign, we asked the council to collaborate with us on redesigning the plans because we had some outline plans made, yep. alternative plans. They've refused to engage with us. Now Peabody has become the main developer. It was news to us earlier this year, we didn't realise that. And we are appealing to Peabody to please hold these plans, we look at them, collaborate with the community, and we will them in order that we can save this incredibly valuable space mm -hmm. that helps people's health and well-being, along with not demolishing council homes. Some people have lived there for 31 years. It's yeah. a proper tight community. It's not necessary. We are pro-social housing. We don't mind. We want the development to happen that will house as many people that need housing as possible. That's great. We are not against that at all. We are just asking the plans to be redrawn. Dozens of residents and supporters have refused to move from a wildlife garden in South East London, which they say is under threat from developers. It's owned by Lewisham Council, who want to force the occupiers to go. Pretty soon after Lewisham Council made the decision to finally go ahead with the destruction of the garden, um, that's when a core group of people who'd been involved in the garden for quite some time started seeing the possibilities of what we could do with that space, that it was a space that we could defend if it came down to it. It became this, you know, squat and a, a kind of a political occupation. Oh, Ian! Morning. Hello. Here we are. Got it. Have you been to? No, it's open up. We can go underneath. Oh, I wonder. Are they not open? Hello. Oh, I wonder. They're not open at all. Oh, I haven't managed to get. So, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. How's your family? Coming back? Yeah, they're back just last night. So when I woke up, it was a bit hard to get away. Take me down to Old Tide Mill Garden The birds in the trees The flowers and the bees And the things that creep and crawl The worst things that creep and crawl Are the councillors in the town hall It was a thing that had to be done and that was the first time I've done that. The first time. And it felt good. It felt like the right thing to do. You know, it felt like something valuable was going to be taken away from me. And you had to shout about it. You know, the suffering silence. I would change my diary. I mean, I'm even doing shopping for my mum, like, I don't know how I do the shopping like it. Right, I've got to get to garden like, you know. <laughs> Come back, I thought, right, I'm here now. How can I help? Like you know, it, it was one of the one of those things that you you didn't think twice about. There are all sorts of situations for arguments to arise. And they did, but everything was always resolved through having these big meetings, which would be 20, 30 people, who came to a, a consensus of what to do. It was then that people started calling me an anarchist, <laughs> and then I decided that I probably was by then, because I'd seen that all different people who might be excluded from society could actually be included. And one in particular, he was ill and needed to go to A and E. He had a bath here and and I gave him a t shirt that I had 
And then he went and found out that he got terrible fever mm -hmm. and needed antibiotics. And he was in no state to go and get them before. The T-shirt I'd given him, <laughs> I got a Day of the Dead skull on it. And he went to a party a few days later. That was a Day of the Dead party. He said, I was wearing just the right things. And, and it was lovely. Mm -hmm. So he became a person. And if I'd seen him on the street, possibly asking for money or holding a can of drink, I probably wouldn't have got to know him. Mm -hmm. But I did get to know people. I, I loved it because I love the coming together of people. It's my big passion in life. And, and the fact that people that came together in the garden were of a like mind and that were there to resist the destruction of something so beautiful and also something so valuable as people's homes. I mean, there was a lot of thought and a lot of discussion a lot of work went into continually highlighting and ensuring that the campaign was visible. It's all very well going to a, a meeting with the um, councillors but I think the only thing that really might push people into changing is to be very visible yeah. and loud. They don't like hearing our voices at all. Oh here's another one Trout. Cool. Oh, they're lovely and... This is, rather, this is very Mondrian or something. Put that on. <laughs> Go on, put it on. Come on. Are you ready? It's art, man, <laughs> but not as we know it. <laughs> oh, I made another hat. Oh, good. Well, this is the hat department. I, is that your responsibility? Just a minute. Take my glasses off. Put my hat on. That's me. Sorry, darling. Josephine Baker, look out. Amazing. <laughs> oh, look at you. I put everything. Donuts. Right. Sausage roll. No? Donuts? I just had breakfast, but that is donuts Vegetable bake. Good. I might need a donut anyway. Vegetable bake. Or you got chicken bake. Very hot, nice. Mm. A lot of people have been sleeping here and they need it. Yeah, save yeah. it for them. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm panicking. Sorry. We're getting on my case. Here I am. <laughs> right, should we go? Are we ready? Okay, let's go. a wonderful space for all the community including myself and my grandchildren who are in the block that they want to knock down. I've lived in this block for over 30 years and most of my neighbours have lived there 25 years plus and they want to knock down our block 
and completely knock down our community, which is the block and the garden. And we want to stop them from doing that because it's unjust and it's unfair. garden to maybe spend a couple of hours so that we can release some of the people that are sleeping there some of us that are there all day um, and come the time that we can let you know that the bailiffs are on their way and if there's enough of us there they will go because they're scared of big numbers we are prepared to fight to the end if anyone here is willing to get arrested we are willing to get arrested uh, we will actually chain ourselves to the trees. Um, so, I don't know. Any politicians here? That's all we're going to do, so fuck you! So when it came to the eviction, I think we knew something was going to happen. <laughs> we didn't know exactly how it was going to pan out. I don't think their intelligence was very good. Maybe their intelligence deliberately wasn't good, that they were suggesting that there was a large number of people living in the garden, that, um, that they were going to have to come in really heavy, but they did come in really heavy. was actually at home because I had a broken shoulder. I remember in the morning hearing all this noise and looking out the back bedroom window and just seeing coach upon coach of thugs. That's the only, sorry, I can't call them what they're supposed to be called because they were absolute thugs pouring into the area and surrounding the garden. You don't know what you are doing. You are fucking helping them to destroy this garden. What are you talking about? They will destroy the council house next door. What are you talking about? No, what you are working for. No, what you are paying for. So if anyone can't start this job now, Oh, no. Do not hurt that lady! Oh, no. 
You should have a cherry picker! Not laden! Hey! Hey! Are you watching Okay, I'm making sure that you don't pass this line. Yeah, well, you're like 20 of you. Can one of you could at least watch, you know? To make sure that person is safe. Yeah. They are not safe and you are not looking. Hey! I find it quite difficult even now. Um, I, I was out on the streets all day really and it was good to have all the people I knew and lots more standing up against all those security guards and police who were guarding them and not us. It's where people of different races, backgrounds have all come together and shared a community. This garden has built a community. Do you have a family? Do you have a park that you like to go to? How would you feel if the council decided to just take the park away from you and to stop your family bringing your kids to somewhere safe to play? Don't push, me. Don't, don't, don't push, don't push me. I'm allowed to go there. This is a public You're pathway. You're not allowed to not stop in the way. me. Don't push me. He not Pushing you. a little old lady. No, he just did. She's 26. And the one that shoved me is 41. <coughs> and they're only county private security and I'm in a public space and I just wanted to see what they were doing to my garden. <coughs> With me now is Diane, we spoke to her last week. Now, your block is looking next door. Are you worried that you might be facing this sort of, uh, well, onslaught, if you like, the bailiffs and the police when you have to leave your property? Yes, it's extremely worrying um, you know, to get up in the morning and look out your window and see my whole road covered in police. It's totally unnecessary, the amount of police force that's here. I think it was about two coach loads have been sent down here along with security. And it is, it's worrying because we're next, basically. How are they going to push us out? We've been fighting this for over 10 years and this is the result. And Heather, I mean, you're quite upset about this and that's quite difficult for you. I mean, it's D-Day today, the bailiffs are here and the site, I mean, we can hear it being smashed up behind us. I mean, it's, it's quite upset. Yeah, well, it's, it, 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 it's incredibly upsetting, all, this, all the structures that we built with love to share with the community. They've just destroyed our reading room, our library and our, our campaign room. They'd, it's just like they're enjoying themselves, you know, destroying. They don't have to destroy that right now, but they're doing it. It's so provocative. I find it so provocative. How dare you do this? You this vandals! How on dare here. you? Vandals! That was a reading room and a library. You're taking down a library. That's all it is. And you're just demolishing it for what? Shame on you! 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 Save our trees! Save our trees! Save our trees! Save our trees! Louis Shame! Louis Shame! Louis Shame! Listen, this ledge could be 
to your daughter, you okay, to your, your son, okay, to you to use. <laughs> Then there was a point where things sort of got a bit escalated and I was stood outside my block um, and I was told by a female security to stand back across this line, which I did do. And then another security, a male security, came from behind the female and behind me and grabbed me quite forcefully over my shoulders and my bad shoulder and started pushing me to where towards where all the focus was going on. And he grabbed me so forcefully that I was in so much pain, I actually collapsed with the pain and, you know, had to be checked out by ambulance and later on go to the hospital just to make sure that he hadn't done any further damage. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had evidence of when I was attacked mm -hmm. And that's the only way to describe it, because um, I was attacked, and they just threw it out. You know, I've seen sort of smaller things, even the, the people that were part of the occupation having to go to court over the slightest of thing. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the police are hand in hand with the council, and the council are hand in hand with the security. Everybody was has their hand in, basically. I suppose I'm very disappointed, you know, I just, it just made me feel like we're nobody, we're nothing. We understand there's no one left still occupying the garden, but security remains tight around the entire perimeter to stop anyone else getting in. The council says it has looked at other options, but ultimately something it says has got to give to meet housing demands. This garden is not um, this luscious Babylon, uh, Gardens of Babylon or um, Kew Gardens. This is a, a, a small space. It was unbelievable to see that, you know, to walk past that every day, to see guards around a garden, like, you know, who the think, what's that? What are they protecting? You know, I've never seen that before. Quite a few of the residents wouldn't walk that side of the road, they would walk on one side of the road, because it was very intimidating, and then guards, a lot of them were very rude. There's times when I wouldn't walk on that side of the road either. And another time, I felt angry and I purposely walk on that side of the road. You know, even though they were intimidating, I'd walk, look them straight in the eye. It's, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of anger um, with all my neighbours. You know, anger with the whole episode, you know, anger with the money that was spent on security um, when it could have been invested into our block. We're paying rent and you're not doing anything. How, how can they not go ahead with a community collaborative design process that's going to cost £50,000? If they'd have done that, then we wouldn't have occupied the garden. They wouldn't have sent 130 bailiffs to evict us violently. They wouldn't then have had 50 guards on the garden. So they wouldn't have spent had to spend that money 
and they could have spent £50,000 on actually doing a collaborative community design process with the community. And if it didn't work, then we would have maybe accepted that. Who knows? We don't know because they never allowed that to happen. I was telling a lot of people at work about it. You know, I was surprised that some of my colleagues, they were going through some similar things or are going to be going through similar things. You know, I said, you better be aware. I said, you've got to take part and, you know, protect what's yours. Otherwise, once it's gone, it's gone forever. against the gentrification of our home and our community. I would like to tell you that I think you're going to have to really step it up. Lewisham Council set in, sent in 150 police and bailiffs to evict us from our legal occupation in the garden on Monday. Most of the local residents came out uh, we made a big noise. They are vilifying us. They are saying that the people that were there were from outside of the area. Well, I can assure you that is not true. So all I'm saying is, in solidarity with anyone who has ever been evicted on the instruction of their Labour Council, then shame on all of those councils. And... In solidarity with you all, let's just fight. I'm sorry, it's going to take direct action. They're not going to listen to anything. We put forward um, alternative plans. We tried absolutely everything. We've tried the legal route. We've tried everything. They will not listen. So we have to make them listen. So please, please try and do everything you can to highlight it at every opportunity that you have. And that's all I've got to say. Bye. The council just were just not willing to work with the community. That's the bottom line. Is the council had basically decided what they were going to do, come hell or high water, they were going for the plan that they wanted to. You could get that sense from the meetings. You know, um, they would hear, but they wouldn't listen. They weren't listening, it wasn't active listening, they weren't going to take any notice of anybody. They certainly didn't want to be told um, by the neighbourhood forum, you know, that they could do better. People pretending to listen, but not listening, you know, they, they don't, they've got their agenda, that is it. Mm. You know, and they'll do their five minutes or their percentage of listening that they have to do within that agenda and but still go ahead with it. In all those years of working towards the final approval for the plans in September 2017, the council and family mosaic as the housing association was but they then merged with Peabody, pressure was put on them to provide a better deal. In other words there was more rented allegedly social housing provided than there had been in the initial plans. And all of this arose not through a straightforward consultation process, but through, uh, through extra pressure being exerted, through campaigning. Didn't know what other steps to take apart from doing petitions, you know, and, you know, part of the learning curve with the garden was there are other steps you can take, you know. Um, Unless you group together, you, you, there's no support. Now, all I kept thinking was, we need to raise the profile. It's all about making it visible. So I 
I and I, but I found that I had no. At the time, I didn't. I didn't really. Allies in doing no. This. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. everyone else seemed to trust in the political process, and uh, and I'm not saying I think they could have worked alongside each other. Mm. Um, but there wasn't really the will. And the sorry, the actual destruction of the garden. Can you talk me through that day? Oh, God, that was probably one of the saddest days. We lost the garden, and Reginald House is next. The planners, councillors and housing association wouldn't listen to us, didn't want to understand why we valued a scruffy block of masonettes and garden when we could have new modern flats and hard landscaping, treated us with contempt rather than collaborating with us to build social homes without demolition. Our campaign does mean 104 social homes will be built for Deptford, that's eight times more than in the original plans. And Reginald House tenants will get new flats in Deptford, with the same rent and of the same size. We were standing on the shoulders of campaigners before us, who won the argument that social rather than private homes will solve the housing crisis, and that it's wrong to force poorer people out of where they live. We need safe, secure homes. And we also need clean air, green space, places to play, grow and share food, make music and art, come together, our markets, community centres, parks and gardens. We should be able to influence together what happens to these places. I inhabit Deptford differently because of Tidemore Garden and all the people I met there. And I have neighbours who fix my electrics, gigged with my band, given me somewhere to be when my ex's anger blew up, been there for a chat when I've been low. I feel part of a community, rather than just living somewhere I mostly just commute from. That wasn't destroyed with the garden, far from it, but it exists in spite of our council and their partners. I think they were, they, they could not stand the fact that they had met this kind of resistance outside of the the only way that they accept that the that dissent is allowable, which is that you, you allegedly can vote them in or out uh, every time that there are elections. It's about money, power and control. Mm. And they're the three things that the council and the developer have. 
that the local community don't have. And that's why there's always this imbalance of power. Um, that's why you've got these major sort of themes of injustice and inequality running through all of the regeneration projects across London. It's the same issues time and time again. Mm. Councils making bad decisions on behalf of their community. Councils not standing up for their communities like they should. Councils taking the easy route to get easy money, regardless of the consequences of the communities that get destroyed and broken up as a result. I think throughout this story, I felt more and more betrayed by people that I voted for and did believe in. I believed that Labour would be different. That threw me completely from what I'd always believed, that I was part of things that they were generally benign and and I found that I had to alter my whole view of how things were. And that was very tough for me to do. They've destroyed a part of the community, a part of what we had. Mm. But we will keep fighting for green space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's always another fight. Yeah, there's always another fight. Yeah. You know. Maybe if, uh, maybe we can build a new one, just to, like the same one, but more, uh, even more extra activities. Yeah, maybe children can design it because they like they do with the, the garden. Knowledge. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. kids help design the garden. Yeah. Even though technically we lost, we were listened to this time. They were forced to listen to our thoughts, our feelings, what we wanted. You know, so you know that is a massive good that came out of it. You know, it sort of inspired me and gave me a lot more hope and. You know, it, inv it invigorated me, mm. but sadly, we lost the battle. Mm.